videos in which I'm looking at the range of obsessive compulsive disorder subtypes. And in this video, I'm going to be looking particularly at the OCD subtype, which we call harm OCD. Now, harm OCD is the type of OCD in which the nature of the intrusions themselves are all about causing harm to other people. And so this might take the form of having an intrusive thought about, say, wanting to kind of attack a family member, to stab a family member, um, to, to punch somebody in the street, to, you know, to kick, kick somebody, you know, off the train platform in front of a train. Okay. Now, what we kind of understand in obsessive compulsive disorder and a lot of the research is that these types of intrusions, whether people will admit to having them or not, these intrusions are very commonplace in non-clinical populations. Okay, so the studies, the research seems to suggest that actually, you know, we all have thoughts like this, random thoughts, not necessarily pleasant thoughts, but certainly intrusive thoughts that just pop up for us from time to time, which, you know, might just cause a little bit of distress for us in that moment. And with OCD, um, it's a little bit different. So when somebody with OCD has one of these intrusive thoughts, they assume that that thought says something about themselves, such as I'm in danger of acting on this thought, or this thought says something bad about me, like I'm an evil person, or you know, I could be a murderer or something like that. And then they also kind of take, overestimate their responsibility for taking action for it. So if they are assuming there that they are at risk of acting upon this thought, and they are thinking, Do you know what, the very fact that I've had this thought means that I must want to do something, they then start to craft their lives around minimizing the possibility of that event occurring. Okay. So typically what that means is they will then engage in all of the compulsions that are consistent with the type of stuff we see in OCD. In harm OCD, these are often kind of gathered around a minimizing threat, you know, acting upon these intrusions. So what that could mean uh, in essence is they might um, reassure themselves in their head. They might kind of constantly say, actually, no, I'm a good person. I, I'm a good person. I love my family. You know, these are not the type of things that I would want to do. We could also kind of engage in things like thought suppression deliberately trying to push the you know the intrusive thoughts away they could also engage in more kind of overt compulsion so these could be things like um you know every time they see a knife in the house or something like that they might just kind of make sure that they take a knife and put it away or they might just use kind of more um avoidance based behavior so if they're sitting there and they're watching tv and there is um i don't know somebody acting out some after harm, it could be somebody attacking someone or murdering someone, etc. So they will just avoid doing that. If they are sitting by people who they typically um, want to minimize the risk of harming, then they'll spend a lot of time avoiding them or trying to control their OCD while they're spending time with them. The problem with all of this stuff is that it contributes to maintenance of these negative beliefs. Um, in a sense that, you know, if I didn't hide the knife that time, then the bad thing could have happened. So better safe than sorry, keep hiding those knives. Yeah. This cycle continues. So ultimately, that's where we get the obsessive aspect of harm OCD, where we are continually living our lives, trying to get rid of this thought, these, these kinds of thoughts that are, are preoccupying us. And our life just becomes more and more kind of focused on this. And we're just not living our lives the way we truly want to live in. As you can imagine, this is incredibly debilitating, distressing, it creates a lot of anxiety for people. Now, the thing about anxiety itself, um, I'll go into a little bit of detail about that. So if we are assuming something to be, or if we are praising something as being a threat to us, our body typically will respond with a fear response. And in the case of OCD, this is exactly what's happening. So we are assuming there that the nature of our thoughts, our internal world, is an actual threat. Okay? Now, we evolved our ability to deal with threats. We evolved our, um, our fear response um, you know, millennia ago um, in response to externalized threats. So if there were any kind of 
I don't know, predators or, or things like that in our environment, then absolutely we should experience fear and our body should respond with, you know, the whole kind of fight or flight response, increased heart rate, physical tension. We There's changes in the way we think about things. There's certainly changes in the way we attend to things. So all of these kind of factors, they are really beneficial for us when dealing with an external threat. The problem with OCD is that it is not an external threat. The threat is in here, okay, or the perceived threat is in here. So our fight or flight response, if it assumes this thought to be in and of itself a danger, then what it does, it will then start to look out for, yeah, and try to detect more instances of that threat. So we then we got this whole idea where even at an automatic level, our mind is kind of looking out for where that next thought is coming from. And one of the functions of our language is if uh, my mind is saying, look out for those thoughts, look out for those bad thoughts. My prefrontal cortex, where a lot of the thinking comes from, it'll go, do you mean this thought? And all of a sudden there, we've got the intrusion back. Okay? So we're dealing with this kind of complex interplay of these old, you know, kinds of um, aspects of our brain's hierarchy where this threat response is coming from. And all of our thinking brains, you know, strategies to get rid of a perceived threat. Okay. However, it simply doesn't work. And that's where we get ourselves into the loop, the obsession, the compulsions, and that debilitating effect on the type of life that we want to live. So in terms of treatment, so I am a cognitive behavior therapist. Um, a lot of my work is based around obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'm going to take you through a little bit about what it actually looks like from a cognitive behavioral perspective. Okay. Now I'm showing you this because um, it's really important that we understand the, the maintaining factors. Okay. So what I'm going to bring up for you now is just this little model, the treatment model. Let's get it up here. Okay. So in this model, um, we can actually see here that we are presented with a certain trigger. Okay. Somebody will see a trigger in this instance, seeing a kitchen knife, and they will have an intrusive thought about murdering one of their children, yeah, slashing their throat. It could be at the level of an edge. It could be, you know, a, a thought itself constructed verbally. What tends to happen then is because they have this intrusive thought, rather than just dismissing it as we would any other type of thought, we attribute meaning to it. Okay. Now, we attribute this meaning in this particular model, the meaning that this person is attributing is having this thought means that I must want to kill my child. I'm a murderer. I need to be stopped. I need to be arrested, etc. Okay. So it's rather than just dismissing the thoughts, it's just, you know, another one of those not very nice thoughts that we are all capable of having. We then appraise it as being something that says something really deep about us. And actually, it doesn't just say stuff about us now, it says stuff about our future. Okay. Now, because this thought goes against who we see ourselves as being as a person, the, the word there is what we call ego dystonic. What then tends to happen is because, because we've appraised it as being a potential threat to ourselves today, to our loved ones, to our future, we then experience that threat response. Okay. So that was where we will get that emotional state. If you look over at this side, on the left side of the model, that emotional state, fear, shame, etc. Okay. What we will then do is we will start to engage in our safety seeking behaviors. These are typically the compulsions that we engage in. And we can separate these into what we call overt compulsions, things we see, and then covert compulsions, um, which is the stuff that goes on in our heads. Okay. So, example, we could seek reassurance from people, um, I'm a good person, yeah? or we might want our family members to reassure us maybe that, um, you know, that, 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 that they feel loved or that, or that they know that we love them, etc. We might go internally uh, with our covert responses, we might kind of check out, you know, we might be looking for any urges that we're going to act on these thoughts. We might engage in kind of the mental arguments and reassuring ourselves that we're not a bad person, etc. We also, because of the, the role that fear plays um, in terms of organizing our attention, um, we then also will start to kind of look out for more danger. 
Okay, so we're just kind of looking for any situation where we might have that another thought, okay? And again, the consequence of that is then everything becomes a little bit scarier. Yeah, every situation, it's almost like we are anticipating having that thought. And again, like I said before, if we're anticipating the thought, absolutely our prefrontal cortex, our thinking brain is going, is going to kind of say, do you mean this thought? Yeah, we get that increase in the frequency of those thoughts, we then get the, um, you know, and then we start to get more terrified by it. So we have an increase, I suppose, in the intensity of the emotion that we feel in relation to it. Okay. And this other kind of bit of the, the model here is that we will then engage in a lot of avoidance. Okay. <clears throat> if we're anticipating these thoughts, we believe them to be danger, using all these other kind of safety seeking behaviors, we then start avoiding the triggers. Yeah, we're treating the thought as though it was an actual real danger to us. Yeah, we're treating that thought in the same way as we would treat a real threat. You know, if there was a saber tooth tiger that was in your living room, that is the way we are organizing our reality. Yeah, we, we are every situation is based around avoiding these perceived threats or thoughts. So, targets for cognitive behavior therapy. Given the fact that we know that intrusive thoughts are commonplace, we are interested more in targeting the meaning or appraisal of what it means to have a thought. Okay. Now, there are lots and lots of ways to do this in cognitive behavior therapy. We will sometimes use what we call behavioral experiments. So we will test out what it feels like to have a thought, hold the thought there and see whether it comes true in any capacity. We could also test out our beliefs about what happens if we just sit with um you know sit with the distress yeah sometimes the we have certain beliefs in ocd that this distress will get too much for me so that i will act out yeah so we will test that we'll test that in session and um, i'll create little experiments on an ongoing basis there so you can just kind of test out whether this theory that i'm a bad person i'm a murderer i'm going to act upon these intrusive thoughts we can test out whether that is an accurate representation of your problem or whether it is our OCD explanation. Do you know what? I've got this OCD, a psychological condition that makes me feel anxious about the risk of harming other people. Yeah. So we, we're always, always kind of rea reality testing when we use cognitive interventions so we can get a reappraisal of what it means to have and had an intrusive thought. Okay. But the most, um, well, the most effective mode of cognitive behavioral intervention is something which comes from the behavioral school of psychology and it is something which we call exposure and response prevention now exposure and response prevention when it is done well when it is done correctly is a massively effective way of enabling us to reappraise what it means to have a thought to learn what it's like to sit with intense emotion yeah and to kind of realize exactly just that these are just thoughts and i do not need to act upon them in the way that i have been doing yeah so i don't need to engage in these compulsions the avoidance all that stuff okay how it works essentially is that we will <clears throat> provoke a thought yeah through using either what we call um in vivo exposure or we will provoke a thought using imaginal exposure and in some cases, we might even kind of provoke an edge, yeah, notice what the edge feels like and see what it is in the body. We call that interoceptive exposure. And we will expose you to those kind of sensations, images, thoughts, all that kind of stuff. And then we will gauge the level of distress that you experience as a consequence. Okay, so typically, if I've got that intrusive thought there, you know, if I provoke an intrusive thought about causing harm to someone and I believe I am at risk of acting on that, I start to experience an increase in emotional distress, that's our anxiety. And typically, where we would start to engage in a compulsion to get rid of it or to disconfirm the thought, in our session, in our therapy, we will say, okay, well, let's just stay with that at that point. This is your response prevention, sometimes also called ritual prevention. So we'll get you to sit with that, okay? And we will notice it and you will have the urge to engage in a compulsion. Your heart will be pounding. We will have these beliefs that our anxiety is just going to go through the roof. But we will say, okay, well, let's stay with that for a little bit. Let's test out what happens when we don't use this. And we will stay with it and we will stay with it. And then over the course of time in a session, again, this isn't quick. Sometimes the, you know, the desire to do it will, will kind of be so overwhelming. But we will coach you through kind of to stay with that. 
and stay with it up until it reaches a certain point where your mind starts to reappraise or certainly your brain starts to reappraise what's actually happening here. Is this a real threat? Am I actually in danger? Or am I using all of this energy in a really cost of, you know, an inefficient way, thinking that this thing is a threat? So we tend to do, well, at that point, we start to do what we call habituation. So we will start to kind of, you know, notice this is not a danger. It's not the danger that I thought it was before. And then it starts to come down and it will start to come down. Um, you know, it will start to come down in quite a gradual way. And you might even get a little bit of a kind of peak again as we start to doubt and worry, etc. again. But over time, generally, it starts to come down. Okay. And then we repeat that process. Okay. So we're always coming back to this powerful exposure and response prevention bit because it just enables us to start to understand at a deeper level, at the level of thought, at the level of emotion, um, that actually the stuff that's going on in there is not the same as a real threat. Now, there's different approaches to exposure. What we have, um, sometimes people will do what we call flooding. Flooding is where we don't approach it in a graded way. Yeah, we'll say, okay, let's just go in there with the thought. Let's just have the thought, or let's just kind of sit here with a knife and, you know, your child's there. Let's just sit with that, okay? Heart's pounds, and we might feel overwhelmed. And, and to be honest, sometimes that can be a little bit overwhelming for people. And, you know, they might, you know, even sometimes people might disengage from the process, okay? Uh, kind of, kind of way, yeah, in a way that a lot of CBT therapists approach it, is we will do what we call um, a graded hierarchy. So we might just start with, um, I don't know, sitting with a butter knife, for instance, or something like that. And we will sit with the knife and we will look at the knife and we will think about all the intrusive thoughts. We'll let those thoughts kind of come up, but we're just kind of looking at that little knife. And we're not engaging in compulsions. We're deliberately sitting with those thoughts. If I have that thought, I'm going to stab my therapist or something like that. I would say, okay, let's, let's, let's acknowledge that thought. We might even say, okay, well, you might do, absolutely, okay? We'll sit with it, okay? Heart's pounding, feeling it, and then it'll get to a certain point, and then anxiety will start to come down as we relearn that this thing in and of itself and the thoughts that come with it are not a real threat, okay? And then we step it up, and we might start to use a slightly bigger knife, for instance, or we might watch, say, a slasher movie on the TV, or we might, um, I don't know, read a newspaper report about a serial killer or something like that, and we'll build it up gradually, okay? What we'd also include is what we call um, imaginal exposure. Imaginal exposure is a good way of kind of tackling um, situations that are not kind of immediately available to us in terms of exposure. So, you know, we can get you to hold the knife, they are accessible, but if, we, if the threat if the meaning that we attribute to our intrusive thought relates to some kind of future, a future where we are in jail, a future where, you know, we, we are on the front page of, of the newspaper, where we're kind of this notorious kind of serial killer, the type of person, you know, that their family totally reject and we're spared from society, we're in the you know, prison with all the, all of the kind of, you know, um, notorious predators, etc. We want to create that. We want to kind of you know, not avoid it. So we will create a narrative. We will write out a script, an imaginal exposure script, and we will expose you to that. This works because, you know, again, we're, we're teaching your fight or flight stuff, the amygdala in your brain, to start to kind of again reappraise. I can sit with this incredibly distressing, feared, you know, not wanted, imagined future scenario. And it's totally different to the reality itself. It is not a threat. Okay, it's a perceived threat, it's a imagined threat. So that's how we would do the imaginal exposure, and we would incorporate that on the graded hierarchy as well. Okay, so that's a summary really of what we would look to do in cognitive behavior therapy for harm OCD. And um, again, there's lots of little kind of factors there which we can bring into it. You know, there's interventions which we would look at, which are slightly more kind of recent developments, things like developing emotional acceptance a little bit yeah, and kind of teaching you how to, you know, approach some of those difficult emotions in a more, um, you know, in, in a slightly more comfortable way, yeah, reappraise what it is like to have an emotional experience. Um, you know, and again, there's a little bit more kind of cognitive work which we could do around OCD themes like magical thinking, 
thought action fusion um you know kind of predictive thinking a lot of these kind of little tricks there that our minds will play upon us that keep us thinking that this type of thought is something that needs to be acted on okay so that is a, a general overview there's tons more stuff that we could talk about with OCD. I could talk about it all day. Um, if you're interested in exploring more about OCD and its subtypes, you can check out some of my other videos. You can also go to my website, uh, accesscbt.co.uk, and look at some of the stuff that I've written on there. I'm going to be doing a load more of these videos over the next couple of weeks. So um, I hope you have found this one interesting helpful um, and I hope you carry on checking out more of this stuff in the future. Thank you. Take it easy.